to the session SUSE ALP prototype on AWS, experimental but fun. My name is Dominik Wombacher. I'm a senior partner solutions architect at AWS. I help SUSE to bring their products to AWS, but also to support partners and customers um, to optimize existing workloads and migrating new workloads to AWS. Today, I talk about my experience um, to build and run an SUSE ALP image on, on AWS. I will start with a few words about ALP, how an image for AWS can build by using OBS, how to this finished image on OBS then becomes an actual AWS AMI, and how is it to run AW, uh, ALP on AWS. First, a short disclaimer, um, because SUSE ALP is still in an early development phase. Um, personally, I would even call it a prototype, and I think SUSE does, SUSE does the same, um, where a lot of things can and definitely will change um, before a final release. The EC2 AMI I built and talk about is an unofficial and unsupported image, um, which is for testing purposes only. I did it because I'm really excited about this next generation operating system, and I wanted to share um, my learnings and experiences. My statements are based on my interpretation and understanding of public available information from SUSE which are definitely subject to change. There are other sessions um, at SUSECon 23 where you can dive deep into SUSE ALP. I will therefore only focus on a small subset um, that I personally like most. So what's SUSE ALP? Um, the idea is to have a really lightweight operating system which comes just with a container runtime and the necessary tools. Um, there is a layered approach, or there's a separation between the host operating system and the actual application layer. And applications are supposed to run inside containers. Um, I think that makes it a major difference compared to how it is today, because the application runs directly on the operating system. Um, it's an immutable operating system, which simplify speaking just means you can't change files or folders on the root partition. Um, and all updates are applied uh, or none of them. So that's the whole transactional update thing. So, so either it's successful or not, so there's nothing in between. It's security focused because you definitely lower the possible attack surface um, with these mechanisms like as a Linux or the fact that it's an immutable operating system. My personal free technical highlights on SUSE ALP um, is definitely the, the read-only file system, so this immutability. So because you know you can't change anything on your root file system without following a specified process. That makes it really stable. Um, and for sure, there are some exceptions. Um, you can change config files, and application data can be stored in part, um, which is writable. But the core operating system is read-only. How is that actually achieved? Um, ALP boots into a separate snapshot. Um, and changing something on the operating system means actually booting into a new snapshot. Um, more on this on, on the next slide. And then you have zero touch configuration. Um, and that basically means if you don't want to touch the operating system manually, you don't have to. Um, there are a lot of different tools like Ignition, Combustion, Afterburn, um, Ansible, Salt to, to do the whole operating system configuration, either at boot time or later during operation. 
I think it's worth to, to dive deeper on how these transactional updates are working. Um, we just go from, from left to, to the right and start with the green um, boot um, snapshot one box. Um, that's our starting point. And then I want to apply updates, for example. Um, and in the past, I typed zipper up and that's it. And now I would use a transactional update up. And when I use this command, what then is going to happen is it creates a new snapshot. And then inside this new snapshot, zipper up runs and performs the upgrades, installs packages and stuff like that. If that's successful and everything was installed, um, it just looks for me as a user like there was nothing happened, right? Um, and, and that's because my system is still running in the snapshot one. So I have now this new snapshot with all the new packages, but right now I'm running the old snapshot. Um, what I now have to do is I have to restart my system. And then during this restart, it will boot from snapshot number two and snapshot number two will become my new running operating system. Um, in case um, I can't boot from snapshot two for whatever reason, failure or something, then there will be a fallback to snapshot one, which basically means um, I can just continue to work with my system the same way as it was before I applied these updates. So and that's the whole transactional thing, right? So either it's 100% successful, it boots into the new snapshot and I use that one or something fails down the road and I always run with my previous version. Challenges. Um, I think we all need that climbing the Alps isn't always easy. And I think it's the same for SUSE with the new operating system. So my impression is that um, ALP focus on being um, a real new, um, yeah, a new operating system with new approaches, um, which solves problems without caring too much about backward compatibility. So that means that the, um, the difference between the common SLE code base is quite large. Um, and the way how ALP is working, right? So with the whole um, immutability, transactional updates and, and stuff like that. So um, that means it comes with a lot of breaking changes actually compared to, to SLE. Um, that's why I think it's quite unlikely um, that there will be an, an in-place upgrade path to, um, from SLE to ALP. Um, so for example, you have ButterFS. ButterFS as a root file system is mandatory for ALP. Um, there are different sub-volumes um, and they need to be configured in a way how ALP expects them. So this alone is a huge challenge. And given the fact that a lot of SLE installations are using AXT or XFS um, on the root file system, just that is already a challenge, right? Um, but again, ALP is in an early stage, um, so there might be ways um, to do that and different scenarios how to do such an upgrade or migration um, in future. So we just wait and see uh, what SUSE will come up with. Um, yeah, and then the, um, the thing that applications are running in containers um, with some logic to create systemd um, services or to make these applications usable in a very similar way as um, classic RPMs. And that's a really interesting approach, but it's not, not necessarily easy to achieve also from a technical point. Um, it requires some additional work, but I think that's more on the developer side, not really on the user side at the end. Um, there are some demo workloads available for this whole application inside my container thing. So I suggest you give it a try um, if you're interested in and, and see by yourself how, how that works. So building uh, an AWS EC2 image. So all the different steps that we need to do, um, we start with what's actually an AMI, talk a little about the life cycle, and then we go from OBS to actually 
how to build a custom OVS package. Um, so first, what's an AMI? Um, our Amazon machine image, it basically contains the operating system. Um, so and without an AMI, you just can't launch an EC2 um, instance on AWS, right? It's quite easy. So no operating system, no compute instance. Um, but besides the operating system, uh, an AMI also contains some additional software, multiple volumes, metadata. So it's not just the raw image. Um, there are further information included in such an AMI. Um, there are a lot of different AMIs available. Um, either directly from AWS, like SLAS, or a lot of other from third parties. Um, and it's not limited to just Windows or Linux to really classic operating systems. An AMI can, can even contain uh, a ready-to-use software appliance or something very specific um, from a vendor. Um, also, AMIs can be customized. Um, when you just want to build a master image out of a standard AMI, um, the Amazon EC2 image builder is probably um, the easiest way to achieve that. Um, but you can also build one from scratch, um, what I actually did with uh, SUSE, SUSE ALP. To understand the um, build from scratch um, and the customization part a little better, um, let's just walk through how a regular AMI lifecycle looks like. Um, so we learned that every AMI is based on one or more snapshots, volumes, um, and I create or import such a snapshot in my system. And then I register that snapshot as an AMI by combining the raw image I have with additional metadata, um, like name, device mapping, and stuff like that. And then in the next step, I can launch an EC2 instance. I can manually customize these instance, create a new snapshot, and register this one as AMI. So I have this full um, cycle from snapshot, register, AMI, launch, customize, go back to create, and so on. Alternatively, I can also say, hey, I have an AMI, and I copy this AMI to another AMI. And as you can see, it's always these great register and launch steps um, involved. So now that we know um, what an AMI is, so, so what's OBS? Um, the Open Build Service is an open source solution um, to build and distribute binary packages. Um, it's a generic or let's say flexible system um, to automate the whole workflow when I want to go from source to an actual binary package. There are a lot of formats um, available. So there are classic packages like DAP or RPM for various distributions, but also container images or VM images are possible. Um, the public instance, which everyone can um, use to build on packages or on open source packages, um, is hosted by the OpenSUSE project. And, and that's exactly the instance that I also use to build the, the ALP image. That's a simplified um, OBS package workflow without going into each and every possible detail. That's just to ensure that we are all on the same page um, and that the following steps that I'm going to explain make sense to you. So we start in the middle with, with open um, build service. That's where I have my package. Um, then from left to right, I start with um, committing my code to that OBS package then OBS performs a build of that package for me and publish the results. For the next iteration, um, I check out my package from OBS. Um, I perform my changes, whatever I want to change in my, my package and my code. I do a new commit and then OBS recognized that I updated the source. It again does a build for me and then it publishes the results and so on and so on. So that's the whole workflow. The OBS package for the AWS EC2 AMI that I, that I built. Um, so we learned what an AMI is, we learned um, what OBS is, and now let's zoom in a little into this actual package which, which builds 
um, the ALP image. I used SUSE ALP Bedrock in version 0 0.1 as my starting point. And after diving into the code, which is used by SUSE to build, for example, KVM images, um, I identified three um, packages that I needed, which are not part of ALP. Um, so I created branches in my own project for cloud in it, for Amazon SSM agent, and for Flatpak. Um, I know that SUSE um, is using Ignition, Combustion, and I think also Afterburn um, to perform this first boot configuration. Um, and it looks like that this would also work with, with AWS. But for my first version, I decided to go with the classic cloud init package and approach, which is today used in most of the AMI, AMIs, so, so even the official ones. Um, Amazon SSM agent, that's necessary to interact um, with Amazon System Manager, and I will talk about that a little later. Yeah, and last but not least, Flatpak. So that was mainly out of my personal interest if that would work and might be an additional option to run applications on top of ALB, uh, ALP compared to these the classic um, OCI compliant containers. So now that I had an idea about the ALP part, um, I wanted to learn more about how other EC2 images are built um, and use the OpenSUSE Leap cloud image as my starting point. And it became clear that it will also need um, the AWS CLI cloud net config for EC2 and, and DHCP client in my own image. And then the last step were overlay, uh, uh, overlays, yeah. Um, there are basically archives with a folder structure similar to the actual operating system, and they will be extracted during the build and becoming part of the final image. Um, so for example, I have an EC2 root um, overlay, which includes the basic cloud init config, so for the EC2 user and stuff like that. Also settings for time server, kernel modules, um, UDF rules, um, and also a customized message of the day. Um, having them in this file structure um, and in this archive, that just helps me to, to customize my, my build image without the need of writing scripts or um, doing something else during the build. So it just takes it, the archive extracts it, and it's done, right? Um, and I also added an overlay for the repo configuration um, based on my branched images or my branch packages, but also for the ALP Bedrock packages. Um, and you might wonder why for, for Bedrock. So shouldn't, shouldn't that be included already um, during the build automatically because I built my image based on Bedrock? Um, and yeah, in theory, that's, that's true. Um, but the package which does this kind of configuration had a minor bug. So depending on the host which the image was built or running, um, the path to the repository was sometimes just not reachable. And that was because the, um, um, the arc variable was used in the URL. And sometimes um, this variable also contains a suffix. So it's not just um, x86, um, 64, sometimes it's um, underscore v3, underscore v4. So um, using the variable base arc instead solves this problem. Um, I created a Bugzilla entry for that, and it was picked up very quickly and fixed in, in the package for, for next releases. But I decided to, to stay with my workaround for now and then jump to the next um, to the fixed package and then in the next release then. And I think this outlines why it's so valuable to do these kind of early testing um, because that, that was a sort of bug which yeah was, was identified because I worked on that and then we could improve it. Whew, um, yeah, a lot of things that we already covered. Um, right, so let's put all these, these bits and pieces together. So. We know what OBS is, an AMI is, how this um, 
uh, OBS package for the image is, is high level working. So how does the workflow, the automation and the testing for all this looks like? Um, so first, how do we come from OBS to AMI? So OBS builds my image, I have a raw image over there. So what's next? Um, OBS has a built-in cloud upload feature, but it requires that I initiate it manually and can't be automated yet. So I started with a good old manual workflow. And it should look familiar to you because um, that's actually what we covered earlier. So at the top, we have the OBS workflow. At the bottom, we have the AMI workflow. And now we put it together by adding um, three new steps. It's the download, decompress, and the upload step. OBS compress raw images with uh, XZ format. But when I want to import it in AWS, I need it as uncompressed um, image. So that's why we need an additional decompressed step. I wrote a small Python CLI tool for that. So it does the first five steps on the right side for me. So download, decompress, upload to S3, import, and register. Um, and during the development, I did the launch part myself. Um, and I think that's OK um, for development purposes. But as soon I reached a point where SSH is working, so, so the image booted up, it was reachable by SSH, I wanted to have it more automated. Um, so, and that's it. That's my full automated workflow to go from OBS to an AMI. So on the left side at the bottom, we have OBS. And then we have an AMQP service from OpenSUSE. So every event in OBS, or every, yeah, every event actually in OBS triggers also something in the AMQP service and get published there. Um, I needed something to listen on these events. So I decided to go with AWS Fargate. Um, that's where I can run a simple, small container image. This image is. Uh, continuously looking for, for publishing events. So my image is built on OBS and it's get published and then Fargates recognize that. And from there I trigger code pipeline. And in code pipeline, I have my source, my build and my testing stage. Um, source stage is basically just getting my Python CLI tool and make it available for code build. And then the actual build stage is then done in code build um, which does the download, the compression, upload, import, and register for me. It communicates with S3 and OBS in that purpose. So it downloads the image, decompress it, uploads it to S3, imports it. And then the last stage is um, an EC2 instance where I do the testing, and I will explain more of that on the next slide. Um, the whole infrastructure is built with AWS CDK. So that I have all my infrastructure as code, but not as GML. Um, with AWS CDK, I can use programming languages. In my case, I use Python for that to, to automatically set up all these um, services. Um, how does the testing works? Actually, um, I use Ansible for the testing stuff. It's triggered by code pipeline. And then code build starts a container. And inside that container, I install Ansible and my playbook, then I run it. Ansible will deploy an EC2 instance with the latest image for me, and then performs various checks and cleans up afterwards. On the right side, we have a snippet of such a playbook. And most important is the check mode, which I set to true. Um, Ansible is technically a config management system, but check mode means um, whatever I declared in my playbook what's my expectation, what the system should be configured, will be verified. And if changes need to be made, I will see that. Or otherwise, Ansible will say, hey, no changes need to be made. And I use that as testing mechanism, because um, if there would be changes that Ansible need to make, that just means that my image is not in the state that I expected it. So in that case, a test would fail. 
And I found that a very fast and easy way to define my tests because I don't have to write much code or reinvent the wheel. Let's jump to SUSE LP on AWS. So what's the state of integration? How does it compare? How does it run on, on AWS um, in comparison to, to SLAS? Um, I can already say everything that I personally would expect from an image worked already very well. So for example, customizing the operating system during the first boot with cloud in it, check, that works. Um, accessing metadata service to retrieve information about the running instance, also no problem. Um, I can use the uh, NTP and DNS service um, through the link local addresses. And I include the AWS CLI package in my build um, and could directly interact with other AWS services. So for example, um, I uploaded a file from that instance to S3 without a problem. Um, in case I didn't mention it earlier, I decided to go with a classic RPM package um, from OpenSUSE factory for the AWS CLI package. And I think in the spirit of ALP, um, this should be based on a container image next time in my next release. Um, yeah, and did you remember that I also included this um, AWS, uh, uh, Amazon SSM agent um, and so the agent starts at establish a connection to um, AWS Systems Manager. And I was also able to use the run command and fleet and session manager features. So I have to admit, um, I didn't expect it such a great um, result when I started with tinkering with ALP. Um, yeah, and <laughs> then we came to the point, um, how does it compare to SLAS? And when I came up with that session, I planned to talk about the differences on AWS, but because of the good results that I explained earlier, I realized it's more about general differences uh, of both and not just with a view on AWS. Um, but indeed, so the first one is AWS related. So Systems Manager um, does not officially support ALP. Um, I think that's expected and makes sense. Um, it's not even released yet. So um, but as we saw, it already worked with a lot of features, right? Um, so as soon as ALP reaches a final state, I'm confident that AWS um, SSM support will, will follow. Most um, of the rest was briefly touched um, already earlier, so let's just focus on a few ones. Um, as a Linux is um, running in enforced mode by default, which is a great plus from a, from a security perspective. Um, Wicked was replaced by Network Manager um, to manage the networking on the system. I'm not sure how I personally feel about that because during the last years, I really um, started to like Wicked. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, um, it, it makes sense yeah, to um, go to Network Manager, which, which is just more and more popular and more used. Um, for troubleshooting purposes, there is a toolbox container available. So things are a little different here as well when engineers want to test things out and troubleshoot stuff on the operating system layer, but that's fine. That's just a little change um, more from a how I do it, not from a technical point. Um, so, but yeah, my, my personal highlights are transactional updates and actually Susan Vector, which is now part of, of ALP. Um, yeah, and, and that's the proof that no Vector is actually running on my ALP test system. Um, in case you don't know NoVector yet, um, it's a container security solution from SUSE. Um, and besides vulnerability scanning, it also comes with um, the capability to scan, analyze, allow, uh, and block runtime or network on level or on network level. And the integration with, with ALP is, is actually super interesting because um, think about a solution that gives you the full security insights into your system and all installed applications. So because with ALP, every application is a container, right? So um, it's available as a demo workload and can be installed with just two commands. Um, I tried it on an instance with two CPUs, two gig of RAM. Um, I suggest you use something with a little more resources for testing. So it, it worked, but took a while to, to get started. But as soon as it was started, it was actually working um, very fine. Um, yeah, feedback is very important for us at Amazon. So please scan the link and let me know what you think about this session. 
Um, if you have questions or want to reach out, please um, use the email address I shared at the beginning of the presentation or leave your name, mail address and comment as part of the survey and I will come back to you shortly. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention and your interest in SUSE ALP and AWS and enjoy the rest of SUSECon 23.